it's said that nothing moves you like a citroen. Well, in this program, we aim to explain the basic operating principles and layout of the hydropneumatic suspension, braking and steering systems as fitted to the Xantia and XM models. And whether you're new to the Citroen franchise or an experienced member of the team, you should find it interesting and helpful. A second program will concentrate on the routine servicing and basic repair operations of the system. Additionally, each program has an accompanying workbook containing questions that you will need to answer and return to Citroen's training department at Slough for marking. We'll start by looking at the suspension system, then the braking circuit, and finally the power steering system. To aid explanation, we'll use some simple graphics, which are not intended to be fully detailed, but will help explain the underlying principles. The purpose of a vehicle's suspension is to isolate or filter out the road shocks to provide a comfortable and stable ride. For the best possible comfort, the suspension should be soft or flexible, allowing for large movements of the wheels. On the other hand, for the best road holding, it's necessary to maintain the tyres in contact with the road and control the oscillating movements of the vehicle caused by an uneven surface. It's difficult to reconcile all these requirements in a conventional mechanical suspension. What we see today is the result of many years of development resulting in significant advantages in the active safety of our cars. In the Xantia and XM, the conventional road spring and shock absorber are replaced by a hydropneumatic sphere. These are immediately visible when you're working on the car. As the name suggests, hydropneumatic relies upon a liquid and a gas for the system to work. And it's important to remember that a gas is compressible and that a liquid is not. More specifically, the system uses nitrogen gas and LHM hydraulic fluid. LHM stands for liquid hydraulic mineral and is a green mineral hydraulic fluid which does not absorb water. But we'll talk about the servicing requirements in a later program. A synthetic rubber diaphragm separates the gas from the fluid within the sphere and the sphere is attached to the wheel by a cylinder and piston. The gas acts as a spring would do in a conventional suspension system. If a load is applied, the gas becomes compressed as its volume decreases. When the load is removed, the gas expands and the system returns to its original position. If we want to keep the car at a constant ride height after adding a load, then introducing additional fluid under pressure will restore the height to the desired setting. So by adding or removing fluid, we have a method of maintaining the ride height, thereby allowing the suspension to work effectively and meet our criteria for comfort and safety. The component used to achieve this is called a height corrector. There's one for the front suspension spheres and one for the rear suspension spheres. This valve is linked to the suspension arms and allows additional fluid either into the spheres or out of them and back to a reservoir. In its neutral position, which is when the car is at its correct ride height, no fluid flows through the valve. When the load is removed, the link arm moves the valve and fluid can escape until the car settles at its correct height. When the car is loaded, the height corrector is moved in the opposite direction, allowing pressurized fluid into the sphere. In turn, the car is automatically raised to compensate for the load. There is a small time delay mechanism within the height corrector to prevent the system from reacting too quickly 
thereby ensuring a smooth and comfortable ride. The suspension also includes a manual height lever. It gives the driver the ability to increase the ride height to an intermediate position for driving over uneven road surfaces, for example. The lever also has two extreme positions used mainly when changing a wheel or during servicing. Conventional suspension systems, such as the Zara, have a shock absorber or damper to control the oscillations of the wheels and body. And so do hydropneumatic systems. And if you're wondering where it's fitted on our cars, well, it's here, an integral part of the sphere. The damper slows down the movement of fluid and due to its simple design and location should never need replacing. Now, having studied the basic principles, let's look at the system in a little more detail. To provide the system with fluid, there is a reservoir. And to alert the driver should the fluid fall too low, the reservoir has a level indicator and a separate switch to operate a warning lamp and stop lamp. Fluid from the reservoir is delivered by an engine-driven pump to the main accumulator. In reality, it's just another sphere combined with a pressure-regulating valve. Pressurized LHM enters the accumulator sphere and pushes on the diaphragm, in turn compressing the gas. LHM is now stored in the accumulator until the system requires it, whereupon it's supplied progressively and smoothly to the particular circuit. The pressure regulating valve and accumulator maintain the pressure to between approximately 140 and 170 bar. Any excess fluid is returned to the reservoir through this pipe. As long as the system pressure is above 140 bar, fluid from the pump can be returned to the reservoir via the pressure regulator and in doing so bypasses the accumulator. So the pump is simply spinning without pressurizing any fluid. This is known as freewheeling or idling. The pump is only called upon to top up the system once the pressure has dropped to below 140 bar. For your safety, and that of others nearby, extreme care must be taken when working on the system, as fluids at these high pressures can penetrate the skin. So please, if working on the system, follow the procedures in the workshop manual and be safe. One component we've not yet mentioned is the safety valve. It's the final component in the part of the system known as the source and reserve of pressure and its function is twofold. Firstly, it supplies pressurized fluid to the braking system and the suspension. We've omitted the brake circuit from this diagram to simplify it, but it's supplied from here. Secondly, should a circuit fail, the valve ensures that the pressure is maintained in the remaining circuits. It also gives priority to safety-related systems, such as the brakes. Should the pressure in the system fall to somewhere between 80 and 100 bar, a switch on the safety valve illuminates a warning lamp indicating to the driver the need to stop. So to recap then, everything between the reservoir up to and including the safety valve is part of the source and reserve of pressure. From the source and reserve of pressure, LHM passes to the height correctors and then to the suspension spheres. Fluid leaving the spheres via the height correctors is returned to the reservoir in separate pipes, shown here. Now to recap, our source and reserve of pressure directly feeds the front and rear suspension. Now let's move on and look at the braking system. The dual circuit braking system, split front and rear, 
draws its energy from the high pressure supply circuit. An important point to remember here is that the braking system is power braking, not servo assisted. The effort required to stop the car is generated by the system, not by the driver's leg muscles. When the driver depresses the brake pedal, a brake control valve allows LHM fluid to flow to the brake calipers. Incidentally, some of your colleagues may call it a brake dozer. We'll see how it's constructed and how it works in a later program. The front circuit receives fluid from the safety valve. The rear, on the other hand, gets its fluid from the suspension spheres. This means that each brake circuit is totally independent. The brake control valve also has a return line to the reservoir. What's really clever is that because the rear suspension units feed the rear brakes, any increase in the load on the rear wheels results in an increase in pressure in both the rear suspension units and the rear brake circuit. Therefore, the maximum braking effort on the rear wheels is directly related to the load. Now to recap, here's another way of looking at the system we've explained so far. Our source and reserve of pressure directly feeds the front and rear suspension. The brake control valve has two circuits. It receives system pressure from our source and reserve and makes this available for the front brakes. And its other half receives pressure from the rear suspension to supply the rear brakes. Note that the handbrake works on the front wheels. The handbrake cables connect to the front brake calipers and the linkages push the pistons, and in turn the brake pads, against the front discs. By the way, Citroen are the only volume car manufacturer to use a power braking system. It has several advantages compared to a conventional system. For example, the pedal travel and the response time are reduced, and it requires very little effort from the driver. Another labour-saving system is the power steering, which we'll look at next. Unlike earlier Citroen models, the power steering is effectively a separate system although it does share the same reservoir and part of the pump. Taking a closer look at the pump, it's known as a 6 plus 2 pump and can be identified by the fact that it has two outlets. It's split into two parts, which share a common feed from the reservoir. The first part, which supplies the power steering, has six pistons, or pumping elements, and a pressure regulator whereas the second part contains two pistons and supplies the suspension and braking systems. Power steering relies upon large quantities of fluid, and so six pumping elements are required. The pump draws fluid from the reservoir, and via the pinion control valve delivers it to the steering rack's hydraulic ram. We'll explain how the pinion valve and ram work together in a later video. For now, it's sufficient to know that the pressure in the system is limited by the pressure regulator in the six-piston part of the pump. Note, though, that some early models drew upon the source and reserve system to power the steering. These can be easily recognised as they use a different type of pump, identified by a single outlet. 1998 model year right-hand drive V6 cars are also a little different. Their pressure regulating valve for the power steering is fitted remotely and is also adjustable. And one further point to remember is that, although not imported into the UK, left-hand drive V6 XM models use a totally different type of steering system, so if you're working on any of these vehicles, refer to the workshop manual at all times. In this final part of the programme, we'll look at some refinements to the system. A well-known characteristic of earlier cars was that the suspension would sink overnight. 
So to overcome this, Citroen now fit anti-sinking valves between the safety valve and the height correctors. The front one is situated under the fluid reservoir and the rear valve is above the rear subframe. However, as a result, if a fault developed and the safety valve closed, no fluid would be available for the rear brakes because the anti-sinking valve would also have closed. So to avoid such a problem, an additional sphere is fitted. It acts as a rear brake accumulator to supply the brake control valve. A simple way of knowing if the car has anti-sinking valves is to look at the pump. If it's a 6 plus 2 pump, then you can be sure it will also be fitted with anti-sinking valves and a rear brake accumulator. And now one final point to note. A controlled leakage, aiding lubrication, will always occur naturally within the various components. This fluid is returned to the reservoir via a network of return pipes. And that concludes our introduction to Citroen Hydro Pneumatic Systems. We hope it's removed some of the mystique about the system and that you've found it useful. Please now stop the tape and answer the questions in the workbook.